The scripture explicitly declares you cannot come to God unless you're drawn. Is that right? So if you can't even come to him unless the Spirit leads you, Jesus is specific to un unfold a very important and pivotal scripture about relationship with you. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. You didn't wake up one day and say, I, I think I'll quit running around. I, I think I'll quit whoremongering and being frustrated. I think I'll quit doing the things I used to do and give my life to God. Now, you may in your cognitive reason or your intelligence say, you know, I made the choice to serve God. But make no mistake about it. He was drawing you before that conscious decision was ever made. Now, the scripture tells us that he's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to eternal life, right? And yet we know it is the will of God that everyone be saved, but everyone will not be saved, teaching us a core principle that God's purpose is that all find truth, but yet all will not respond to that overriding purpose of God. And so the simple reality is this. God chooses individual. And I don't know about you. If he chose me, I plan to find out why. Amen. In fact, that is one of my most favorite scriptures, John 15 and 16, because it speaks of, to me, a purpose in my choosing. I'll finish quoting it. It said, you did not choose me. I chose you. Right? Now, what's the next verse? Do you know? Don't put it on the board yet. You need to know this verse. And, does anyone know that next phrase? And ordained you. That means that my life had purpose in the choosing and there's something beyond the initial act of the salvation experience. If you're fighting the same issues you used to fight 10 years ago, you're not growing. Something's wrong. If you're wrestling the same devils you were wrestling two years ago, something's wrong. Your life in Christ is intended to mature, develop, and be enhanced. Uh, you say, wait a minute, Brother Joe. You don't know that. I don't like that. That's insulting. Something's wrong. You are engineered by the mere intelligence of God and the fact you were chosen that you are to develop. So now put 15 and 16 of John on the board. He said, you do not choose me. I chose you, and I ordained, I purposed you, I established you. And watch what he said, John 15 and 16. I'm waiting on you up there. John 15 and 16. I purposed you, I ordained you, that you should, you ready? Say go. go. Say go. Say it again. Say go. go. He said, I purposed you, that you should go. In other words, he has purposed you that something would happen within you and that there would be a, a reason. God makes no investment he doesn't expect a return on. God expects a return on the spirit he places in you. How many of you enjoy wasting money? How many of you buy things just so that they will depreciate? None of us. And don't you believe God's a good steward? So when he makes the transaction that is you as an individual with the eternal soul, with the potential that is resident within you, with the possibilities that are uniquely you, you will go places I never go. You will meet people I never meet. You will interact with family I never interact with. And God expects a return on the investment that is you. Look at that. Say, you've not chosen me. But Jesus said, I chose you. That in and of itself ought to cause a little Holy Ghost stir in your spirit to know that when God analyzed the people that are around you, he chose you. I was on the plane yesterday. I'll be honest, I, fl I flew last week, Saturday, last week, Tuesday, last on Thursday. I was back at the airport on Saturday. I flew four times yesterday. And so when I, and I'll be honest, I put my headphones on and I don't talk to anybody. When I get on the plane, it's a time for me to get geared up for wherever I'm going and quieting down. And I got little noise cancelers, and you can yap, 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 and I can't hear a word you say. I sat down by this gentleman, and I looked over at him, and I never talk to people. And I just had the gift of gab on that airplane yesterday. And so I looked at him, and he had this camo hat on, and it said something about kind of kennels. And so I said, oh, you raise hunting dogs? And that was it. It was on. 
And so we started talking about pheasant hunting, and he was from Kansas. And we got to going through this about what kind of dogs he liked to hunt and what kind of shotguns he liked and where he hunted pheasants in Kansas and where I hunt pheasants. And we started going through all this stuff and common areas we both hunted and all these issues, and it kept unfolding, and it kept unfolding. And, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, I just think, you know, it's about pheasants and dogs and doves and quail and, you know, it, it, it's just man stuff. You gotta be a man to talk about stuff like that, you know? And and so we're we're just kind of rolling through and as it unfolds over the next and and you know after about 10, 15 minutes I was talked out. I'd hit my capacity and I was ready to put my headphones on and cut him out. And just when I go to put him in, he starts talking again. And I thought, oh Lord, would you hush this man up? See, that's what you get for talking. That's what I was thinking. Open your mouth, you open a door to something you don't want to deal with. I'll be honest, that's what I was thinking. And so we kept talking and so so we get going, and it keeps evolving. It keeps evolving. And then he says, you know, and so he owns the, the particular ranch, and, man, they sell. He, he keeps 100 head of horses at all time. He sold 3,000 horses last year. He's a huge horse trader. And I'm getting excited by all this because I'm thinking, hmm, horse guy, land, ranch, hunting. You know, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe I ought to talk a little longer, work this a little better, you know. So we get longer conversation. And, and then all of a sudden he says, you know, he goes, Man, he goes, but what I really do, and I fly all over the country, and I got this other job to support that job, but I do all that because I got a ministry to inner city kids in Wichita. And I thought, oh, no. Now I got a witness. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, Lord, it wasn't enough to be in church all week. You got to put me by somewhere, by some guy. And I said, wow, that's interesting. One of my close friends pastors in Wichita and buses in five, 600 kids every Sunday morning out of the inner city. He goes, you're kidding me. I've been praying for God to connect me with someone that does ministry in the inner city. And I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. Ah. So then I start talking. So then he goes, you know, he said, I have met. He said, I, I'm, I'm raised this particular affiliation. He said, but I'll be honest. I love you, Pentecostals. He said, but I can't talk in tongues. And I thought, oh, Lord. You're talking to Dr. Tongues, you know? So I said, well, let me tell you why you can't. So I started walking him through the Holy Ghost. I started teaching this Bible study. And we start talking about 1 Corinthians 2 and Romans 8 and Acts 2. And we start going through all these scriptures. And tears start coming down his face. He goes, you know, I was trying last week to talk in tongues. And I got to praying. And I was praying hard. And I was praying loud. And I was doing my best. And I, I can't do it. I said, I guarantee you this. And I walked him through it. I said, you know, you could get the Holy Ghost right now if you were comfortable enough for me to pray with you on this plane. He goes, you know, I don't know about that. <laughs> I said, but I tell you what, if you'll visit my friend Morel Cornwell's church. So I said, here's his phone number. Here's his mobile. I got off. I said, hey, Brother Cornwell, I got him half landed. All you got to do is finish the job. He said, Robert, I'll get him in the boat. I'm calling him tonight. I I'm just going to tell you, the likelihood that I would run into that man at that moment. Because I was actually supposed to be on a noon flight that got canceled. And then I had to hang around Columbus, Ohio until 3.30 to catch my 3.30 flight. And then I was in a different seat, and I, they came to me and said, Mr. Tisdale, we're putting you up in the front because of who you are, because you fly all the time, and, and it's free. It's on us. We're just throwing you up there. And then I end up sitting by this man. And then, you know, and normally when they put me up there, I pick which one I want because I like to put my feet up on the wall and sleep. And so I didn't even try. I just thought, well, I'll just sit wherever they got me. And then I sit down, and then two hours and ten minutes later, the last 20 minutes, all we can talk is Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Don't tell me God hasn't chosen you for a reason. That he hasn't placed you where you are for a purpose. And it is imperative. Ephesians 1 and 9. Put it on the board. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. You cannot go through life wondering what is my purpose. You don't have the luxury of spending another day spinning your wheels wondering am I doing God's work. You might be chasing something that is not the purpose of God in your life. You might be working a career, working a job, living in a house, having a relationship with the wrong individual, working around the wrong people, you got to know you're in the right place at the right time. Amen? 
You have to get a little confidence today that God is not surprised by the adversity in your life, the frustrations that are overwhelming you, the confusion that surrounds you. Can, can I just be honest? I'll, be, I'll, I'll just be real clear with you. I was a little irritable yesterday. I had gotten up. I had been up. I got up 5 o'clock your time. I would already been at church. I didn't even get back from church till 2 in the morning. I flew in, had a two-hour drive Thursday, had a two-hour drive Friday, had service Friday. Friday night, had a two-hour back drive back Friday night, had a two-hour drive back to the airport Saturday, only to get there to have my, my ride, my plane canceled, and then the agent wasn't smart enough to fly me straight to New Orleans. She flew me through Dallas into the middle of a storm, and then I got canceled four more times. I landed in Lafayette last night, drove two hours, and got here at two in the morning, all right? So I was a little irritated by the time I sat down by that man on that airplane. But you got to get over your feelings. You got to you got to park your attitude. You got to get your spirit right because things don't always work the way we plan. But God has an agenda that's bigger than your inconvenience, bigger than your frustrations, bigger than the issues in your life. And you got to come to the realization in spiritual maturity that regardless of where you find yourself, how good or how bad it feels, God knows what he's doing. Amen? And I refuse to allow life uh, and its inconvenience uh, to stir up irritation and immaturity in, me, immaturity in me that I miss the moments God's plan for your life. Amen? Amen. You got to determine I'm not going to miss God's purpose because it feels inconvenient because I'm irritated and I don't like where I am. You have to know the mystery of the will of God. It's imperative you find out why this church, why this city, why this day, why this employment, why this career. God has a plan for you. If you believe that, shout yes. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, having made known to us, God didn't choose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you, right? Say amen. amen. And what did he do when he chose you? He ordained you. He purposed you. Amen? He planted you. He established you. How many go to Home Depot and buy plants and just throw them out in your front yard? Go, whoo, hope they grow. You put them out there with strategy and planning and precision. You say, this one needs partial shade for six hours a day. This one needs full sun. This one needs to be on the damp side of the house. This one needs to be on the south side to get all the sunshine. This one needs to be on the north. It needs to be out of that, or, or, or on the east side. It needs to be out of that northern wind that blows in the winter. And you position them where you know they will achieve the best results. God has no less uh, specific intelligence about who you are. He puts you where you're supposed to be to be the most effective. Stop allowing the enemy to manipulate your faith or your belief system, God knows what he's doing. Right. Amen? Amen? So watch, he purposed you, he established you that you should go. Say go. Yeah. You can't go till you tarry. That's the lesson out of Acts. That's why some people are frustrated in their going, they haven't tarried before they went. You gotta tarry. You gotta find the mind of God and the purpose of God and the life of God and what God has planned for you before you go. That's why some people get up and they go in the mornings and they can't figure out why there's no eternal destiny involved in the casualness of their day. You gotta tarry a little bit. It's a principle established in Acts. Before the Holy Ghost empowers you, you gotta tarry. You gotta get on your. That's why we pray before we have service because we're tarrying. We're preparing ourselves that in the going, the purpose of God would be made manifest. That's why you do it in the mornings. That's why you get up. And if it's not an hour, it's 10 minutes or 20 minutes. I believe in a quality of time with God, not necessarily the quantity. Sometimes in discipline, you got to say, I'm going to do 30 minutes. But other days, you just got to make sure you tap in because you got to tarry before you go. He said he purposed you and ordained you that you should go. Say go. But in your going, there's a reason for your going. That ye should bring forth fruit. Say fruit. fruit. Say I am commanded. I'm purposed. 
I'm destined to be prosperous, to bring forth fruit, to be productive. It's the first commandment God made to man. Be fruitful and multiply. My life is supposed to multiply. That's not just bearing kids. That's every aspect of who I am as a human being. I'm supposed to, to enhance whatever situation I'm placed in. Amen? And now this is why. I put John 15 16 back on the board for me. John 15 and 16. And look at this last phrase. This is why he did all that. He chose me. He picked me. I don't know what he saw in you that he didn't see in others. But he saw something unique about you. And in the choosing of you, he purposed. There was an unfolding. There was a divine mystery to his choosing of you. And in choosing, he established you. He got you ready. He purposed you. He released you. And then he brought blessings on your life. He enhanced your life. The level of who you are began to escalate. Your value, your stock began to rise. And this is why. He does all that good stuff so that after this semicolon, look, or colon, excuse me, after the colon. So in other words, everything before this colon is about to explain what comes next in the sentence. That's English language. You ready? So then he says this, that whatsoever ye ask. He said, I did all that so your faith level would rise and you could believe for something better than what's happened. Just let me make it very clear at my first service at a long time at Lee Road. This is not all God has for Lee Road. This building, this crowd, the level of the Holy Ghost you've been having, there's another level, there's another dimension, there's another plane, and we refuse to be satisfied with what God's done, but we're going up to a higher level in the Holy Ghost. That's why you're blessed. That's why you're chosen. That's why your life is enhanced. God did it so whatever you ask, he'll answer. In other words, God's been good to you so you can believe for something better. Amen? Now jump over to 1 19 in Ephesians. We were on 1 and 9. Huh? Go to 1 and 19. Watch this. You ready? Huh? Uh, that you're on John 15 and 16. We were on Ephesians 1 and 9. That was having made known unto us the mystery of his will. You ready? Go back to 18. Watch this. You're going to like this verse. Huh? That the eyes, say the eyes, eyes. of your understanding be enlightened. Say your eyes got to be open. Your eyes have to be open that ye may know. Say that you may know. I got to know. What is the hope of his calling? What did God hope for when he made you? I want to fulfill what God dreamed of when God thought of Robert Tisdale. I want to make full proof of who I am. I want to make sure that my life is what God intends it to be and what God thought when God brought me into this experience of Pentecost. I don't want to waste a moment. I don't want to waste a day. I don't want to spin my wheels. That you may know. What is the hope of his calling? You ought to tell him right now, God, show me the hope of your calling. Show me what you thought of when you made me. You ready? Watch this. What is the riches? Look at this. And what is the riches of his what? The glory of his what? In other words, God has something waiting on me with my name on it. But I got to know what it is, and I got to know what he's purposed, and I got to know what's waiting. Why in the saints? So let's do something. Go to, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. You ready? We've quoted this for hundreds of years, and we quote it in reference to the rapture, in reference to heaven. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. But that ain't about heaven. It's about us. Eyes haven't seen. You aren't creative enough to know what God has purposed for you as an individual. You don't dream big enough. You don't have big enough ideas. You don't hope big enough. You don't imagine large enough. You haven't expanded your mind to the point that you can truly understand everything that God has intended for your life. You say, wait a minute, Brother says, I, I don't know. I'm going to show you. But it is written, your eyes haven't seen, 
Your ears haven't heard. I'm going to tell you right now, nobody's preached the message that unfolded your imagination to the point of, to, that would encompass everything God has. The scripture explicitly teaches us that your ways are not his ways and your thoughts are not his thoughts. I, neither will your ways be his. In other words, you cannot rise to his level. He thinks bigger than you. That's why the scripture said, ha, teaching you ha, that it is impossible to contain him with your thoughts. Ha, for he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or even think. Yes. Amen? Amen? So watch. He said, say it with me. Say, I haven't seen. I haven't seen. Ear have not heard. Ear. Say, neither, neither. have it entered into my heart what God has prepared for me because I love him. That ought to give you a chill right there. That ought to tell you something. You, you, I, I hadn't thought big enough yet. You ready? Now watch this. Watch verse 10. But God hath revealed unto them us by his spirit. What in the world did that mean? Go back. You ready? I haven't seen. Ear hadn't heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man what God hath prepared for them that do love him. You ready? Verse 10. You ready? Watch. But God hath revealed unto them, uh -huh. unto us, excuse me, by them, unto us, by his spirit. The spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The spirit knows what you don't know. The spirit understands what you don't understand. Now, we're going to go on a little bit, and I'm going to show you something. You ready? Watch. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him. Now, this is very easy to interpret. You don't know what I'm thinking. And you probably don't want to know what I'm thinking. Just like I don't know what you're thinking, and I don't want to know what you're thinking. Because if each of us knew everything the other was thinking, we probably wouldn't be real happy. And so the scripture says, you understand this analogy. You don't know the spirit of another man. Only the spirit of that man knows the spirit of that man. In other words, no one knows my thoughts but me. Are you with me? Which is in him. Even so, the things, look at that. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. Now what did 1, 2, and 9 say? Eyes haven't seen Ears haven't heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared. And he said, look, you can dream, you can imagine, you can hope, ah, you can envision, but you cannot know the things I've prepared for you. It's impossible for no man knows the things of the Spirit of God but the Spirit of God. You ready? Verse 12. Now we have received not, not, the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, having made known, Ephesians 1 and 9, the mystery of his will. No wonder you need the Holy Ghost active in your life. Without the Holy Ghost praying on your behalf, without the Spirit of God interceding for your flesh. You cannot know the mystery of why you are you. You cannot have the mystery of God's purpose in your life unfolding to a daily benefit if the Spirit of God is not interceding on your behalf and bringing the conclusion of God's destiny to pass in your everyday life. Are you with me? So go ahead, pray what you want to pray in English. But if you want to make progress, open your mouth and let the Holy Ghost pray on your behalf. Because as long as you control it, as long as you're in your intelligence, as long as you're operating in your cognitive reason, you only get what you think. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want what I think. I want what no eyes have seen and no ears have heard and what I haven't even dreamed about. I want the paracletus. I want the helper. I want the power of God to slip in beside me and help me. Amen? You ready? Look at that. Now we have received 
not the spirit of the world. He said, what you have in you is not of this world. Do you understand that the Holy Ghost within you is more than an emotion? It's more than a feeling. It's more than a goosebump. It's more than a radicalization. It's more, it is the express presence of almighty God in the life of humanity he said I will not leave you comfortless but I will come to you you have the expressed presence of God dwelling within your life working on your behalf let it out let it talk yeah. amen amen Everything that God ever created, he created with spoken word. Let there be light and there was light. All things operate under the symmetry and the authority of his word. All the creation is upheld by the power of his majestic word. No wonder he gives you a speaking gift. And the power of the Holy Ghost falls in your life. And you babble in a language you can't understand. Every time you talk in tongues, something's happening in the spirit realm. Every time you talk in the Holy Ghost, creation is happening in the dark of your reality. When the spirit begins to pray, it effectively does what you cannot do in your English. Next verse, 13. Hallelujah. You ready? Which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Stop trying to figure out. Let the Holy Ghost have access. Stop trying to dominate and control. Let me tell you. Talking in tongues is often about control because we want to control it. We want to direct it. And one of the issues that's hard for some people to pray and travail and pray in intercession is we don't want to pray what we don't understand we're praying about. But that's exactly the point. If you only pray about what you understand, then you limit the authority of God to enact change in your life. Because quite frankly, you're not intelligent enough to know what I need. And you're not even not smart enough to know what you need. The scripture said that the heart of a man is deceitfully wicked. No one knows it. You don't even know why you are where you are. You don't know why you act like you act. You don't know why you ended up where you ended up. That's why you got to have the Holy Ghost praying on your behalf. Go to Romans 8 and 26. Go to Romans 8 and 26. You ready? 8 and 26 of Romans. Here we go. Watch this. I'll just start it again. You ready? Look at that. Likewise. We may have to go back to 22. Key it up in a minute. Likewise, the Spirit also does what? Helpeth my what? Oh, it helps my colds and my flus and my back aches. How about my weaknesses? How about my tendencies to be flesh-driven, my infirmities, the things that make me weak, that make me sick, that get me off course. Likewise, the Spirit also, that's not its only purpose, but it also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for. I thought you knew yourself. I thought you knew what you needed. If you knew what you needed, you'd have fixed it a long time ago. But you don't know what you need. You don't know how to fix the mess that is you or me or this church or this city or this state. For we know not what we should pray for. I don't even know how to pray for myself. I know I think I know what I need. I, I'd like to say I know me. I'm about to be 45. I'd like to say I got a grip on Robert. But just about the time I think I do, something else pops up, and I think I ain't got it at all. I'm not even sure I'm saved about 80% of the time. Most preachers won't tell you that. I'm just honest. Most preachers want you to think we got a clue. The, the truth is we ain't got a clue. He said, who can know the spirit of a man? Right? That's what Corinthians said. He said, you don't know. You don't know. Now watch this. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. He said, you don't even pray for the right stuff. So I refuse to come to church and spend my wheels wasting my prayers. 
I refuse to walk in the house of God and go through the ritual of, of Pentecost and go through songs and go through a, a day in the house of God without God, giving God permission to pray on my behalf, to pray about the right stuff. I don't have time. I just told you, I, I'm, I'm already a past my allotment. I'm past 50 years. I'm past 50%. I only promised 72. I'm on the downhill slide. Some of y'all got one foot on a banana and one foot in the grave. You on the way out? Not you. I did not you. Don't waste a day. Don't waste a service. Don't let your human intelligence manipulate your prayers. Don't let your emotions undercut your effectiveness. Don't let your philosophies and your ideas, because you know what? We are a compilation of human experience. You act the way you act because of what your daddy did. My dad's been dead six years, and yesterday I was up going through the deal, and I got this, my, my, my boarding pass is on my phone, so I flipped it up on the thing and laid it on the little computer, and he goes, Arr. You know, and, and the guy goes, you in the wrong place. You, you, what, what, what airline are you on? I said, I'm American. And he goes, what's wrong with your phone? And I looked at him and I said, well, that's the wrong boarding pass. Put the right one. He goes, ding. And I go, my daddy always said, you got to be smarter than your equipment. Six years later, I'm still talking about stuff he told me when I was a kid. Because we are the product of the people, the lineage, the history, the influences around us. You are what you came out of. It influences the decisions you make. And that, in turn, influences how you pray. You've never liked the Hatfields. You're a McCoy. And you just can't seem to get over it. You've been fighting with them for years. It influences you. And if you only pray in English, it will hinder your future. you got to let the spirit pray on your behalf what time am I supposed to be done 10 what 10 20 man I got tons of time the spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not tell your neighbor say you don't know what you're talking about oh you make it even better say you don't even have a clue say you don't know me say I don't know me only the Holy Ghost knows what I need. Say it like you mean it. Say, only the Holy Ghost knows what I need. You ought to tell your spouse, pray for me in the Holy Ghost. Whew. Well, I feel like talking in tongues right now. Hallelujah. It's hard to preach on the Holy Ghost without feeling it get stirred up in you, isn't it? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Amen? And then, you know, and I could break that down and I could teach on that for you know not what we should pray for. As we, you may know what you ought to pray for, but you may have the wrong timing. You may have a pretty good idea what God needs to do in your life, but you may be praying at the wrong moment. And you might divert your destiny or delay your blessings because you don't know how to pray as ye ought. I don't want to pray misappropriately. I don't want to pray out of tune, out of sync, out of timing. And I honestly don't know how to do that unless I'm letting the Spirit pray over me. For likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And for those of you that say, yep, I got the Spirit when I made my decision for Christ. I got it right now and I know how to do it. Well, I go, you read on a little bit. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. And it's not in English. With groanings that cannot be uttered with sounds that can't be interpreted. Because if you knew what you were saying when you talked in tongues, this is what I told some of the man, the man yesterday on the, in the plane, if you knew what you were saying when you spoke in tongues, you'd manipulate it. Yes. You've manipulated yes. all your life. Yes. Yes. Anybody got to teach your three-year-old how to manipulate? No. No. They just do it naturally, don't they? It's the curse of flesh. They're manipulating little dudes. And they come out, man, they, they, they come in, my kids, because, you know, I, I fly home. And I'm gone two or three, four days a week. And I fly home. And I hear them in there going, hey. They'll come in and they ask me first. They think I'm the pushover. I don't know where they get that. I don't know how they figured out mama and daddy and we're going to work them against each other. And I'll say, well, what'd your mama say? They'll say, well, blah, 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 blah. I, don't, I mean, you don't even have to be 10 to do that. Three years old, them little crumb snatchers screaming for what they want. And they know how to work you parents. And if you hadn't found how to raise kids in the will and purpose of God out of the word of God, you will get manipulated and it'll be a disaster. I won't preach on spare the rod, spoil the child. I'll leave that alone. That's up to you. 
But if you don't provide the parameters of discipline for your children's life, they will run over you and destroy your family. And the scripture said, a child left to itself will bring its parents to an open shame. And one of the issues we have in America is children are left to themselves. And what's happening is they're bringing parents to an open shame. They're caught in drugs. They're caught in fornication, adultery, prostitution. They're in jail. They're murdering people. You leave them alone with the TV and with the video games and with inappropriate reading material and it will come back to haunt you. I'm going to tell you, can I just tell you right now, read all the Dr. Dobson you want until you learn to pray in the Holy Ghost over your kids. You're spinning your wheels. Did you know that the, every time a child has a miracle in the New Testament, Jesus is involved and the parents are involved. There's not one child that has a miracle that the parents aren't present in the New Testament. I'm telling you right now, it takes three ingredients. It takes the kids, it takes Jesus, and it takes you. Don't bring your kids and expect they'll only they'll be spiritual because you threw them out there in kids' church. Once a week ain't enough. Well, I got a bow up spirit on me today. I got to back off a little bit. But the spirit itself, look at this, maketh intercession. The spirit prays on my behalf. The spirit says, Robert, you don't know yourself. You don't even know your own motives well enough to pray appropriately. You don't know your own heart. You're manipulated by thoughts and ideas. And if you don't let me pray on your behalf, then you don't have what you could have had. So I have to pray, but I have to pray in the spirit. Now that doesn't mean, and, I, and let me, just let me define a few things here. If you learn to pray and you'll open yourself, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If you'll open yourself with praise and adoration and you have the gift of the Spirit, you will find a freedom to talk in tongues. Some of you say, no, I've only done it one time. That's all right. We've got two weeks. We're going to change that right now. You have to find the freedom to let the Spirit have an expression. And it will make intercession. I like to explain it like this. God is the judge. You're the defendant. The Spirit's the attorney. It's the lawyer. He's pleading your case before the throne on your behalf. He's saying, he didn't mean it. He's a better guy than he's been acting. I know his motives are messed up, but, but, but you know what? If we can get that anger out of him from when he was raised by a troubled father, we can make things better. <laughs> you know what? He's only acting that way because he was abandoned at four years old. You don't know what the Holy Ghost is interceding on your behalf, but it's working on your weaknesses. And so you know what happens when I hear myself talking in tongues and I'm magnifying the Lord in a worship service? I get excited because I think something else is getting fixed right now. Something else getting taken care of. Something that's negative, that's going to derail my future, that has the potential to undermine my hope. Something's changing in me right this moment. And that gives me the faith to release it even more. That's why the scripture said, building up your most holy, precious faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. The apostle Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. No wonder he wrote three quarters of the New Testament. The tongue talker. And you know what I like about that? He said, I talk in tongues more than all you people. And I'm in jail over 50% of my adult life. But I've found that no matter where I am, I'm at peace with the Spirit of God in my life. That's what he said. Read verse 27. I'm not even going to finish. i got five minutes watching. And he searcheth. Ooh, who's he there? He's the Spirit of God. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And he searcheth the hearts and knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. He searcheth me. He looks at me and says, What you need, Denny, to be the most effective preacher in Laranja you could ever be, I know you don't know, but I'm searching you. I'm looking under the covers. I'm finding things. You don't even know how to pray, bud. You don't know what to ask for, but I'm praying on your behalf. And I'm checking your motives and your ideas and your dreams and your visions and your hopes and your upbringing and I'm helping you you know go back to that it says it helpeth our weakness huh? you know so, so let me give an example you ready come here come here so here's what happens so so in other words I'm here and I got weakness I can't do it I can't do it but when the spirit of God comes alongside me do you understand that so in other words the spirit is sent to help me in my weakness and then verse 27 said he searched my heart he knows what I need to become the best I can be he knows what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God having made known unto us the mystery of his will you only can discover the mystery of why God chose you if you let the Holy Ghost intercede on your behalf 
behalf. I'm telling you right now, it ought to revolutionize the way you interact with God on a daily basis and in a worship service because you say something's unfolding in me. You chose me. I don't know why, but the Spirit searcheth me. The Spirit knows the mind of God and He knows me, my frailties, my weakness. Make me what I can become. Raise your hands and love the Lord right now. Hallelujah. And when you're praying in the Holy Ghost, I hear it all the time. All the time. How do I know it's the will of God? How do I know it's the will of God? How do I know if God's doing this for me? I'll tell you, it's pretty simple. If you are praying in the Spirit and you're letting the Spirit of God lead you, you don't have to worry about missing the will of God. You can miss it when you're talking to people. You can miss it when you're counseling everybody but the Holy Ghost. You can miss it when you're getting opinions from every person around the country. You can miss it. But when you, listen to me real closely, when you are praying in the Holy Ghost, you've got a promise. For the Holy Ghost is making intercession for the saints according, 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 according to the will of God. Read verse 28. Watch this. And we know. Ooh, look at that. Probably one of the most quoted verses in the entire scriptures and probably greatly misappropriated many times. We quote it to people at all kind of tumultuous events in their life and we go, hey, all things work together for the good of them that love God. Yeah, but we forget that little part. You got to love God. And you got to have the context of this. You got to be praying in the Holy Ghost for that to work. If you ain't praying in the Holy Ghost, then you don't even get that promise. That promise is in Romans 8. That promise is about the Spirit maketh intercession and healing you according and interceding on your behalf according to the will of God and the purpose of God over your life. But if you're outside the purpose of God, you have no guarantees that things are working together for your good. That's why I try to get my flesh out of the way and pray because I don't want nothing God don't want for me. Amen? For them that love God, to them who are called according to His what? There's that word again. You know what I love about the word of God? I started in Ephesians. Then we jumped over to to 1 Corinthians. And then we jumped back to Romans. And there's just a symmetry. We're back to that. What was that scripture we began with in Ephesians 1 and 9? Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, which he hath purposed, the scripture said. Then you went to John 15 and 16. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and ordained you. That's purposed. I established you. I mean, we could jump to Old Testament if you want. Uh, and you should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, planted, you're purposed, you're established. And so then look, and we know that all things work together, them that love God who are called according to his purpose. Say, God has a purpose for who I am. So why don't you raise your hands and say, God, I give you permission to unfold your purpose in my life. Come on, tell him right now. I give you permission, God. Show me the mystery of my choosing. Come on, go ahead. Raise those hands and tell him, Lord, uh, unfold. uh, Unfold the mystery of who I'm supposed to be and what I can become. I don't want to waste another day. I don't want to miss another moment. Uh, I don't want my upbringing, my nature, my carnality, my frustrations, my attitude to hinder my divine destiny. Come on, pray over your own life for a little bit. Direct the power of God in your life. Let the Holy Ghost talk for a moment. Uh, uh, We're going to have a move of the spirit in this house today. Let the Holy Ghost begin to talk. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Pray, pray, pray. Know something's being fixed when you talk in tongues. Know something's being interceded for when you talk in tongues. Know your weakness are being abated and your strength is being enhanced. That's why you get out of English. Because in English you margin the power of God you pray out of emotion you pray out of frustration you pray out of fear you pray out of manipulation but the Holy Ghost bypasses the human condition and the Holy Ghost prays with the mind of God hallelujah hallelujah praise God Stand to your feet, raise your hands, and love him right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Go ahead, let the Holy Ghost speak. Let the Spirit talk.
Let the Holy Ghost refresh you for a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Touch your neighbor. Say, we're going to have a breakthrough today. See you at 1030. Amen.